so excited. Can we dance to start? We can, we can, we can do can. dance, we can do dance. <laughs> All right, here we go. <gasps> Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. Very excited to be talking about how to save the world. We have Katie Patrick joining us on the show. Hello. Hello. Thanks so much for coming on. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I'm so grateful. I'm so, I'm so happy that I found you on the internet and that I found your work to be so fascinating. You agreed to come on the show. We're very excited to be talking to you. Katie Patrick's bio is very cool. Katie is an Australian American environmental engineer and designer. She's the recent author of How to Save the World, which applies powerful techniques from the fields of data science, game design, behavioral psychology, and your creative genius zone to make real and measurable change on the causes you work on. And it's filled with awesome examples. It's also really measurable and actionable on how to realize your full idea potential into the world. Katie's links can be found below, katiepatrick.com as well as her Twitter. So go and take a look. And let's start things off with our fun question about, we find ourselves as stewards of Earth after this long period of evolution. What is your current take on the state of humanity? Well, I'm super optimistic. I'm a huge fan of Steven Pinker's work uh, and this recent book called, um, it's not actually that recent, called Factfulness, which is actually documenting how well we're doing. Humanity is getting better on almost every single thing you can measure. Now, climate change is still very scary and the extinction crisis is real, but there are many other things, basically almost just about anything else that you can measure, we're doing better on. So I see us kind of in this adolescent stage and when I look about where I see the future of humanity going, I don't see apocalypse and doom and gloom. I see futuristic eco cities that are covered with vegetation and huma humanity is realizing their, their true potential as being custodians of the planet. And I see so much good in people. I see people being incredibly creative, uh, being compassionate, being able to learn incredibly complex and diverse skills. And I see this real hunger in people to want to do something good with their lives, to be a, a good person and to contribute something good. And I can't not see that when I look at humanity. I can't not see incredible things happening. So I get really sad when people in my fellow scene of environmental and social impact see this really negative outlook because it's just, it's a lens that you can choose to look out of. You can look at everything that's bad or you can look at everything that's good. And I find everything that is good far more compelling, not just because it's my own idea, but because the evidence backs it up as well. I mean, you just look around at social and environmental change community and the innovation that's going on and you can't not be inspired by what people are doing. So that's what I think. That's my, that's my take on the, where we're at the humanities right now. I think we're just blooming and flowering in a whole lot of ways and there are kinks along the road. Yes, yes. Uh, but don't just look at the kinks. Look at how much we're flowering. Yes, yes. Yeah, you very clearly illustrate our slow but sure update in our mental map. And we're slowly but surely moving towards this more spiritually actualized planet, this cohesive unity. And I love how you illustrate it on an environmental perspective. We're cl closer to Earth. We're living maybe a little bit more harmoniously with our ecosystems. And you have so many great illustrations in your book that, that really um, illustrate this out for us. And I love them. It's like Arcology, which we'll get to later, the portmanteau of architecture and ecology together. So how about you know who you are and how you became who you are today? 20 years of environmental engineering and designing work. How did Katie even pick up that interest? Teach us about your journey. Well, I, I think it was probably even more than 20 years. I've always, always loved the environment, always loved plants and animals. And even some of my earliest memories, I was a child in the 80s. Uh, even when I would just see geology pictures, like illustrations in geology books of the earth, you know, cut in half, like a, um, uh, you know, you can see the magma inside. I just thought that was so cool. I was like, wow, look at the earth. That's amazing. Uh, and there was a lot of um, that sort of old school environmental messaging, that Greenpeace activism style in the 80s. And I remember really paying attention to it as a, as a child and, you know, save the whales, save the dolphins. 
I wanted to save the whales and save the dolphins. Uh, and then as I got into my early teens, that was the kind of Kurt Cobain, kind of grungy, 90 kind of anti-corporate uprising, Naomi Klein, no logo kind of era. Um, I just went full on into the, uh, the whole activism thing, like just in every way that I could. I completely embodied it from the age of about 13 or 14 onwards and then went on to study environmental engineering and then uh, made it my profession, which brought me into being a green building engineer and corporate sustainability. And then being an entrepreneur and designer, Silicon Valley, etc. So it was just always there. And it's just so interesting. You know, I mean, part of what motivated me was because I was distressed by what was going on, deeply, intensely distressed by what was going on. But then also, even if you're not distressed, it's still probably, I think, the most interesting thing you can do with your life. Like, I mean, even as, a, as an engineer, as a computer programmer, as a designer, as someone who has a technical craft, there's really nothing more exciting than figuring out how do you build an entire civilization that works in synchronization with nature? Yes. On every level, water, carbon dioxide, energy, human health, air. I mean, it is a treasure trove of interesting, creative and technical problems that I would like Silicon Valley to get more interested in, get a bit out of the, out of the little app world yes. and start look at the bigger picture. Like how do you make a city work? How do you make an entire forest uh, well, how do you keep the forest there? Hard problem to solve. Uh, it's just so interesting and it just gets more interesting. Yeah, it's, it's so cool how you bring up that when you're a little kid and you're first seeing the, the earth and the, the, the inside of the earth, the magma, and getting excited yeah. about that, getting excited about all these other little tiny um, bursts of, of, of knowledge that got you interested in environmental engineering all the way up to now this bigger vision which we're totally behind of getting silicon valley out of the apps <laughs> and into how do we and like geoengineer a more robustly connected cybernetic earth system and we love that notion and we're really happy that you know that's why you're here talking to us today about this big this big vision how do we move the mentality towards the bigger eight billion humans on this rock in synchrony with all of mother earth's other plants animals ge geology all of that stuff so that makes a lot of sense because then that's the book how to save the world and now let's 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 talk about this from um from a perspective of where you you and i we do things similarly in in some ways when we walk on the street we see the current existing infrastructure of the world and then we see how it could be. Yeah, yeah. And the potential of what could be yeah. in that deep connected cybernetic earth. Mm -hmm. So tell us about how you both see that and how you built that, uh, built that vision out and then also how you pick which ideas you want to actually build on. All right, well, you mentioned quite a few things in, in that. Um, but first, I think we should explain what the cybernetic Earth is, because yes. not, it's not a commonly used phrase. Uh, so what is so exciting about environmental and social change right now is that now that we have the internet and we have a whole bunch of uh, computer frameworks that you can download, you can basically build just about anything you want through existing libraries of code. Uh, there are also low cost sensors that are being, you can go to sparkfun.com, you can just go on Amazon or eBay, and you can get a Raspberry Pi and an Arduino, and you can make with not terribly advanced skills, just through YouTube tutorials, you can make whatever you want that can actually sense, um, sense anything about the planet. You can sense pressure, how heavy something is, you can sense if something's moving, you can sense air pollution, you can sense light, you can sense temperature, and you can do it all DIY of stuff that you can buy and figure out yourself. So, and there are startups working in just about every space with this. So the earth is being covered with sensors. It's becoming like digital eyes and ears for seeing the planet. So things that we couldn't see before, like we couldn't, like we don't know what the air pollution is in this room or out on the street, right? We don't know what the surface temperature is of a particular hot surface in summer in a city that's, that's baking and making people use more air conditioning. Uh, this would probably be a good time to even bring up some of the designs and concepts that you have on your website, katiepatrick.com forward slash designs. Yeah. You talk about the cybernetic earth and all of these incredible uh, sensors that we can have, these new digital eyes and ears. Here, here you have urban canopy thermal, 
taking high resolution thermal images of cities in the summer to show urban heat island effect. And then you can rank properties based on heat scores. Then you have Boston's green cover is 27%. Learn how to green your city, urban canopy. This is very interesting as well. If Seattle, Boston, San Jose, how they're competing in terms of their green cover over time. And, and that's enabled again by the low cost satellites that are there. I mean, once upon a time, we couldn't have the abundance of satellite imagery that we have now. And now it's really easy to get, partly because of this uh, electronic sensor explosion that's that's happening now. People talk about Internet of Things, but really when I think the, the Internet of the, the Earth or Earth Things. Yeah. Uh, and that is just, as, a, as an entrepreneur, as a technical person who likes to come up with ideas, which I know probably your audience in the Silicon Valley community are, I mean, this is the treasure trove of exciting potential. And so I come up with ideas and I, I mock up the ideas, I design them, and I put them on my website. It'd be great if each one was a startup, but I have more ideas. I have ideas constantly I love and them. I can't, yeah. come up with startups constantly uh, so I just design them and sort of put them out into and the world. And someone else can pick them up and execute them if they really enjoy the idea. They can, they are yeah. welcome to steal them but I would prefer to work with someone. Totally. Um, yeah. <laughs> if, uh, the ideas come I, through <laughs> us. into. I do, uh, I don't yeah. believe that I own ideas or anyone really owns them, they do, they're just sort yes, of part yes, of the ether through, and they're channelled yes, through yes, you. Yes, yes. Um, but if somebody does want to steal the idea I would like it if they would get in contact with me and maybe work, we could work together on the on the idea. Yes, yes. Uh, but it's just, this is enabling a whole new different type of environmental activism that we didn't have available to us before because when you can see the numbers it's a little bit like a, um, like a, a Fitbit watch that you might wear um, or even getting on the scales and seeing how much you weigh or uh, seeing nutritional labeling that's another example of just being able to see the numbers or a prius with the dashboard showing that we're getting these feedback loops of data and then we can do comparisons you can be like well that's got that many calories that has 200 calories that has 400 calories so i'll uh choose 200 if i'm on a diet and 400 if i'm like really hungry right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. numbers enable us to make good decisions and yeah. we're highly reactive we're highly emotionally reactive to numbers and so once we have all this data we have all these numbers it enables us to be able to use all these mechanisms of change that we didn't have before before it was just like we're freaking out because everything's dying <laughs> you know yes. uh, so we have to like have a protest or like get really upset about it or we'll make a documentary it was um, that was more of the sort of like phase phase one of environmental change, kind of like sustainability 1.0, so the sustainability 2.0 is this data-driven behavior change type of Fitbit for the planet type of... Yeah, yeah, the um, Fitbit for the planet. I love how you also explain that it's the Internet of Things with especially the 5G infrastructure that's coming in enabling us to get all of this data and then processing the data, making sense of it, but also this component of, of, of things like augmented reality and the potential that that has to give us immediate insights into our environments and make smarter decisions that way. All of these technologies coming together. I actually have an augmented yes. reality one. Good, I was just about to go. Oh good, I just wanted to interrupt you in case you were going to say, say something that. else. <laughs> so we have, this is the civic orb, I want to show this one you were oh, yeah. talking about This is that. not the augmented reality I one know, though. but this one's so interesting okay. though, because an electronic public installation light that shows the electricity use of an entire city in real time communicated by the color of the glowing orb. So here you can see in San Francisco, you're using 64.7 megawatts I, of energy I don't know if right that's now. a correct number, by the way. Correct, yeah, it's probably <laughs> it a could be quite tremendously off. <laughs> more, I don't know, it? I don't yeah. know. But it's um, blue to red as your scale of low to high. An energy leaderboard for apartments, a green cocoon for the vehicles. Uh, this is very beautifully designed. You know, we love stuff like this. And then Garden yeah, City Augmented Reality. The Garden City app uses augmented reality to allow users to superimpose their ideas for living walls, urban trees, and green roofs on the urban surfaces around them. So then this is kind of like what could potentially be with yeah. augmented reality. Kind of yeah. helps people. Yeah. yeah, and I got the idea from that because I stumbled on this way of thinking that I actually drew from the self-help movement. I was reading some health, some self-help books and you know, they're all about like, make a mood board about the life you want, you know, make a vision board and then imagine your vision and it will, it'll kind of happen. And that's how I started thinking about, um, and I realized that, oh, I actually kind of already do this for the urban landscape. I kind of imagine buildings, what they would look like if they were you know, yes. covered in moss and green and trees and these kind of futuristic cities. And so I started doing this as a practice, actually imagining the future world that I would want to have. If I could imagine, I can imagine the utopian version of my own life, but what if I imagine the utopian version of the whole earth? 
And so the limitation of the self-help movement and a lot of spirituality too is that it's kind of all about the self. Yeah. It's always very self-focused. Well, what if we take those things that we can learn from that and we think, well, what about the whole world, right? And so that became really fascinating for me for seeing how you would need a, uh, a vision. And then I realized that that was inherent to the creative process because if an architect wants to build a building, right, they need to, they make a mental model. This is just the scientific study of creativity, right? If you want to make a dress, say you want to make a gown, even if you want to build software, you imagine it, you create this thing, and it's called the positive constructive imagination. That's what science, the scientists who study this call it. You can positively construct in your imagination a detailed thing, right? And then you go through the process of reverse engineering that, and then you make it. So you're imagining and you're making, and you're imagining and you're making. And that's what creativity is, right? So in order to do that, you need to have the, the vision, you need to have the dream. And that's why the Martin Luther King speech was so popular, because it used this, I have a dream. And he didn't say, everything is really bad all the time, this is really terrible. There's a bit of that in the speech. But it's creating a landscape of where you want to go. Uh, and that is incredibly powerfully motivating to people. So if we want to have cities become Sorry. green, covered with trees and vegetation, which they, they need to be. Yes. They, yes. For engineering reasons, for thermal for properties, for reasons. water, for health. It's, it's engineering. You yeah. just cannot build a city completely out of concrete and bitumen and have it totally. work right. Yeah. They need a lot of green space, right? Way more than we have now. Forest therapy is a very real thing. Decreased mm. cortisol levels from our connection to Gaia. Totally. Closer connection the girl, to Mother yeah. Earth. Yeah. Study yeah. after study about it. So the first thing we need is this A, Augmented reality app where you can make imaginary green cities with AR. I that's love it. Let's pull it, it, it You're right because it helps really with people mm. that are going and and envisioning what the future could be like of the cities. And that's yeah, yeah. and that's the idea is that when you can see it, you can be it, and you can set these action steps to get to that yeah. to that point. And that's why you also have so many of the beautiful um, illustrations in the book of what it looks like to have greener cities, um, more ecologically mm. harmonious. Um, places for us to, to live yeah. and reside. And the long explanation is because there's a, a substantial theoretical basis for that. It's not just like, oh, I want to do something with AR and wouldn't it be cool to like put trees on things in AR? It comes from a, a much more substantial theoretical basis of why we need to see images of what we want to have yes. in order to do the work to make that come true. It's an essential part that I think is, yes. is not missing but the volume is turned way down on those visions of what we want. And I think we should turn the volume way up. Way up. So that's that, um, that's that idea. Way up. <laughs> I so, so, so agree with you. And we're going to turn that volume way up together and through disseminating memes that inspire people to, to get used, to get building the future that they want to see, especially on an environmental engineering level. I love that so much. Just a couple of the other quick ones on the way. A public energy displays for commercial buildings, big air quality displays, also very interesting. Small public air quality screens, a carbon Oh, this counter. one's one of my favorites. A carbon counter, global carbon dioxide. Imagine a little parts per million uh, hap in, in Times Square, right? A little parts per million in, in um, uh, maybe in, uh, in, in, in other cities around the world. Maybe in, in, in every city. Beijing, every city. Maybe, right? Maybe another city that has a decent amount of. Do you of, know how yeah. many parts per million carbon dioxide are in the air right now? Just it's off the top of your head, do you know? It's, it's almost it's almost 400. Well, we've got a thing right here that says it, so that's yeah, that kind of cheating. But, but most it, people don't yeah, know. Yeah, Even yeah. people that work on uh, environmental issues often, unless you just work specifically on climate change, a lot of people don't know what that number is. So the, just knowing the number is very well, motivating. Well, knowing so. the number is important, but also knowing mm. that what has it been? It has increased from 300 parts per million to 400 parts per million in what? The last like 20 years or how many years? Uh, 30 years? I don't. No, Ish. exactly. Something in but a couple decades, though? I think in the last, I think it was 280 parts per million at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Oh, so that's actually 150 years. Yeah, that's a long, yeah. long time ago. Okay. Okay, so, so that's it's the about 100 years, let's say, it's been going up quite a bit. Interesting. So things like this, they give us a visual uh, status, a health bar of the earth. Mm -hmm. I like that a lot. And it, and it keeps people engaged with with what what's going on on the planet another one is this v-score 
plant-based swaps that restaurants can make to help people eat more plants and less animals. This is very, very cool as well. All you need sometimes is that little nudge. You, you make this so clear in the book as well. If you just you know, change up some of the words you use or if you change up some of the messaging around um, or incentive systems, mm -hmm. you can get people to make uh, healthier, more sustainable decisions. Yeah, it's actually, there's a lot of tools you can use. When I mean tools, I just mean like the way you word something. Like there's a, a, a lot of study that's been done on these things called social norms, which not everyone has heard about. And social norms basically mean like kind of what everybody else is doing. Like, so you could say uh, there's a whole bunch of basically ways to access the motivational core of the human mind. So if you want to get people to eat less meat and more plants, you could um, you know, shame them or fear them. Meat is murder, meat is terrible, you're a bad person if you eat meat. So that kind of causes people to shut down. Uh, another way using social norms is you would use a phrase that says more and more people are going vegan now. Everybody's going vegan. Vegan is the most popular thing to do. Do you know the eight Jones effect? <laughs> yeah, eight out of ten people are eating more plant-based foods. You basically say, look at what everyone else is doing. And because we're inherently social animals, we want to be doing what everyone else is doing. And we want to be doing well also in comparison. So then if you can take numbers and also rank people to be like, you're like in the, you know, the the sort of like bottom 20th percentile, you know, you could do better, there's room for improvement and you've actually got a barometer, you've got a number, it's not a binary on or off like vegan or not vegan or good or bad or eco-certified or not eco-certified, you've actually got this number that you can work with and you can iteratively improve it. So you've got that feedback of, of iteration. So the, the V-score is the, the percentage, is the ratio of calories, of animal calories to plant calories. Mm -hmm. So you've just got a number and it's yeah. just science. It's Animal not like calories to plant calories and that's yeah, your yeah. yeah, very So if you're over if you're over ninety five percent V score, ninety five percent calories from plants, that's pretty good, right? You, you just know? have to take something like your purchase data and then being able to run that through an algorithm that's able to say, okay, you ate a burger that had this much um, animal uh, caloric content versus mm -hmm. you ate a salad that had this much veg vegetable caloric content. So this is um, potentially through purchase data and through algorithms can parse that. So we don't have to manually go and log every single thing that, that we eat. But this is like kind of like you were saying a little bit of the Jones effect too, where, where you see like, well, you're right, we are social animals that like to see where, you know, well, are you, you know, if Katie's ranking in the top 10 percentile on, on plant-based mm -hmm. nutrition, I mean, what do I need to do to get in the top 10 percentile That's right. plant-based nutrition? And if it's yeah. really low, you're just like, gee, well, you know, it doesn't need to be a, oh, I went vegan or I didn't go vegan. If you could go from a 20% V-score up to a 50%, that would be a huge improvement, you know, and you want to feel, feel good about that. So these kind of mechanisms of using measurement, using comparison, using positive feedback, like, hey, you went up by 10%, good job. Uh, and social norms saying everyone else is doing it. Like, for example, if you are a sustainability manager at a city and you might have like a $500,000 budget to spend on a marketing campaign to get someone to do something, you could do it really wrong. You could do it all the bad way. You could use the wrong phrasing, the wrong type of images, uh, yeah. not use any of the techniques that work, you spend the money and nothing happens. And this has happened over and over again. Yeah. I speak to people all the time. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, we tried something like that and it didn't work. And I said, well... The behavior you, design. I'm like, well, when you actually test this through the academic method, if you were to have phrased it differently, you may very well have had a triple fold a change. So everywhere people are making these mistakes. You lose so many good ones. So many book. mistakes yeah. that I just see over and over again. That. Um, it's just fascinating by just changing a few words. That's yeah. not even like building an app, not even writing a line of code. Yeah, changing um, some words. So the book has like a, a, a nice little snapshot of it. Yep. The field of behavioral psychology is much bigger than what's there, but it's a great starting point where yep. I put a bunch of studies in. You know, like another one is like, is money a motivator? When it was tested, if you tell someone, if you, uh, and it's actually two studies about this, about one is driving the Prius and the other one is saving energy in your home. It was found that the message about carbon dioxide, like you'll save this much carbon dioxide, worked better than the, the money one. And everyone thinks it's the money one, right? But the carbon dioxide is actually more of a pull because it's not that much money that you save. Mm. And we're just a little bit more emotionally connected to, ooh, CO2 polar bears than, ooh, two cents, you know? <laughs> 
Yeah, there's, I want to also speak about this from not only a, you know, behavioral psychology perspective, which, you know, you give so many good examples of here, but also I want to talk about it from moving people from an old mental map to a new mental map. This is something that we also vibe on at a deep level. Um, we think about it as one of the greatest games that we can play is figuring out how to update civilization's code, how to maximize our own potential, bring our ideas into the world. And so when you think about seed of a child getting the right nutrients, getting access to the right creative tools, and then being able to express themselves fully into the world, we want to, to, to see how we can maximize the potential of every single seed to update civilization's code and be in that have the, have that be a co-creative process. So I want to ask you about you know your vision with moving people from an old mental map to a new mental map and the most effective strategies in doing that process. Well I'm not sure if I know that much about the most effective strategy. Well but your I, tools are basically that. Uh I think they yeah, are Yeah well I I mean for the, the, the big kind of upgrade of the mental map. Um, mm -hmm. I do think I made the decision a few years ago to delve into what I call the creative genius zone, which yes. I'm so compelled by. I even put a chapter in it right up the front of the, the, the book. Uh, and I think everything good that comes out of life, maybe everything's a bit of a stretch, but a lot of good things, or well, the core of who you are is making, getting your creative genius zone out of you and yes. cultivating it and practicing it, almost like an Olympic athlete yes. practices their sport, right? Yes. Or a, 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 p a pianist practices the piano, like a professional pianist, right? That you make that, whatever your unique gift is, you make it the sun in your life. And the other things in your life, like your you know, exercise, money, family, friends, even children, are the kind of planets that go planets, around. Yeah the central sun and that sun kind of warms. It's where the energy comes from for the other planets or the orbiting bodies to get uh, life from. And that's kind of my overall kind of world view of how to go about, how to go about life and how to go about your own social and environmental uh, impact. So I think where that comes into this whole idea of upgrading, you know, humanity's mental map. Uh, it's time to move away from this worldview of that you need to have certain sorts of, what do they call it, like the linear career? You know, you have like college, oh, okay. then you yeah. get the mortgage, <laughs> then you get the, the husband or the wife and the children, and then you get work, 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 and then you get reach like a million dollars worth of funds under management or whatever. Uh, and then maybe, you know, people, oh, you do your MBA before you turn 30, before you have your first baby which is actually what someone exactly wrote on a forum once. I was like, who is this lady yeah, who was yeah. like, made sure that she had, and was married for exactly five years before she got pregnant. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, we're, we're not all like that, all right? Um, uh, that there are these kind of like life goals that we get raised with the expectation of, of having. But if you do that in a way, not that any of those things are bad to have, but if you do that without making your creative genius zone the center of your Solar of system. your life, <laughs> then you, people end up getting corroded, you know, the marriage falls apart, you know, they end up getting really depressed with their job. They're like, well, I'm a corporate lawyer and I earn $300,000 a year, but I'm totally suicidal. And there's kind of this existential angst that we have and this craving for meaning and purpose, I believe is because we're not making that the center of our life. And you may need to trade off some material wealth in order to cultivate that, you probably do. Uh, but what you end up with is a different sort of capital. You end up with social capital that, you know, for example, you have like a following. Like I've got this wonderful following on, on Twitter and, and, and Facebook that are, love my work and are, are really encouraging. And that's a real joy to have. I have an enormous amount of creative capital or social capital, lots of friends. I get invited to be a part of stuff and intellectual capital in what I've built in yes, my yes. work. So you kind of build, when you invest in your creative genius zone, you build like an internal garden. Like yeah. it's like watering your own internal spiritual garden. Yeah, yeah. And where this all intersects with saving the world is that I don't think there's any difference between watering this internal garden and saving the world. I think it's the same thing. thing. I think yes. when you invest in your creative genius, yes. when you water that, that thing that you love to do, that thing that you love to contribute, you end up contributing it to the world and it ends up being the, the gift to the world. That's what you contribute. This book is me investing in my creative genius zone, right? Yeah, and this yeah. book, is a gift to the world. The world can now have it, right? It's not just 
in my head anymore totally. like it used to be like yes. it used to be and it took that that commitment yes. um, and it's just so rewarding so I think we need to go through life and we need to raise the next generation of children with that worldview yes yes uh, but so it not just said. but not just about the I mean the gift that's something that people bring up a lot like Oprah's like you're unique create a fingerprint whatever it's also matching it with contribution that's one thing that I think doesn't always get talked about as much Everybody likes to think of themselves as the, you know, the, the, the unique creative flower underneath. We but, all are, though. But what, how are you going to contribute it to the world? Correct. What's the point of having a creative genius zone if it's trapped in your Dropbox folder and it's stuck in the drawer and it's in your garden so nobody can see it? You want to contribute it. You want to share it with the most people as possible. Yes. So you have, this, you have the creative garden, your creative genius zone, mm. your sun, your planet, um, your, your celestial body, and then you're contributing the energy of the star. It's radiating out. The garden is ha reaping, is having fruits emerge from it that then you can then go and distribute. So it's kind of like the sun's energy is distributed towards the planets or the garden's yeah, uh, yeah. fruits are being distributed towards other people in the community. So I like this a lot. It's, it has to happen. It's not going to be stuck in your, yeah, in your yeah, internet. Yeah, but it, it takes practice. Like I wake up every morning and my first thing, and I've been doing this for about three years now, is my first thing is today I will devote the next three hours. So sometimes this is before the baby gets up. It's like five in the morning. Sometimes it's after she's at school. But my first priority is how do I do the most creative thing I can do? One. Second thing that is the most benefit to the world. Mm -hmm. So it's about my creative genius zone, but it's also about the contribution. It's not in a vacuum. And, it's and then I just like, I'm like, universe, overnight. tell me, tell me, yeah. what is it? Um, and sometimes it's like, oh, you've got to get your book out, you've got to finish it. And sometimes it's like you've got to interview that person on a podcast. Like that's what the universe is kind of that calling you, you to do. Yes, yes. Or you've got to make a design of a giant CO2 counter that's going to be in every city yeah, in the world. That's good. Uh, and it's not going to happen mm. overnight. A lot of the millennial Gen Z immediate uh, gratification systems are saying that the, the, the fruits from the garden are going to uh, come in a day that you know you know and they're going to be distributed in a day this takes a long time to write something like how to save the world and to get it you know to take everything from your mental lattice in your mind and be able to distribute that in the most compression algorithm way that inspires as many people around the world as possible is uh, it takes time and it's hard work and so it's important to be patient but i love your analogies here they're so so good the and the way that these things tie together is that every single person's creative genius zone is encoded in their seed and then it's up to us to give the right tools and potential for them to discover that and then enable the the that to be catalyzed into everyone else's worldview is what their uh, their their contribution is and so i love this tying this tying thread between um Bet of, of, of just how beautiful is it to think about it as a, as a planet and uh, as a star and planets or as a garden and the fruits from the garden. Um, I love that so much. Katie. Yeah, yeah. And, it's, and after you've, I've been doing it for a few years now. Uh, even though I did environmental work before then, I didn't sort of do it with this way. Uh, sometimes I just lie in my bed and honestly my inner garden feels so full. I think I have this beautiful child and I, I almost feel it like in my body, you know, like it's so, it feels so fertile and I feel so appreciative that, I, um, that I've been able to put in the, the time and that I actually just did it, that I just committed to, to doing these. You know, sometimes it's an hour, sometimes it's three hours, sometimes it's more. Uh, and just the extreme ruthlessness of putting in that time. And like you said, it is, uh, it is I think it's difficult to do anything good. There is a lot of this, um, you know, people trying to sell you on courses like, oh, I made like $50,000 on the internet or like I went to Silicon Valley and then the people that make a lot of money in Silicon Valley, they go, oh, they just like build a company and sold it for 20 or $50 million. But I think behind anything that's genuinely good, like a, a good film, a good book, a good startup, not one of those like ones that just sort of starts and then dies, but genuinely really substantial startups. Uh, there's a hugely long period of devoted craftsmanship yes. that's gone into it. 
Um, and what I sort of love about pursuing the creative genius zone or the sun idea of your life is that it's not promising you fame and fortune. It's only promising creative fulfillment, right? Mm -hmm. That's <laughs> but the, right. The promise of pursuing a creative genius zone is only going to promise that you'll get more in your creative genius zone and that that garden, that inner garden will be enough. You may make a million dollars, you may not. Mm -hmm. You may go for 15 years without, you know, earning five or $10,000 a year. Um, you may get, even get depressed and come out of it. Uh, it's not promising all these kind of other promises. You know, if you go to Harvard, then you know, your life will be amazing because you went to Harvard, but apparently students at Harvard are more depressed than anybody else. There's so much pressure on them, right? Yes, yes. To perform. But it, it almost like eclipses all of those other kind of things that society is telling you to achieve. Yeah, yeah. Without over-promising what it's going to give you. And I just find personally that that's enough. That's enough for me. The fulfillment of the creative genius zone and the impact that that has, we, sometimes we talk about it as different colors on the color wheel, that there's orange on the color wheel, let's say, impacts just your family and your, just let's say just your family, and then green impacts your family and your friends, and then blue maybe impacts the community as well, and then red on the color wheel maybe impacts the whole world with one of the ideas. And so these are colors on the color wheel, not that one is better or worse than others, it's just that the the creative genius zone that you end up exploring and fulfilling with your life is going to have different scales of impact as well as different um, financial levels of success, these, these types of things. Um, but really, it's about the waking up in the morning and feeling like you're radiating with love and passion for what your adventure is that day. Yeah, although I wouldn't necessarily oversell it, that it's I often know, know. not <laughs> like that. Right. It's like, it's I'm totally really tired and I have to... Yeah, but it's... Yeah. But, but this way, you know, you're going up, <laughs> but it's up, so yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're in the, in the game. I mean, what I talk about in the book, because I couldn't, I didn't feel like I, I couldn't write a book, although the, we haven't gone that much into the sort of technical part of we the book. We will, we're about to. Without yes. touching on this, is that, like, happiness isn't this plateau that you reach in life. It's not like you just, like, do a few things, and then you're like, woohoo, I got it, I got the job, I got the money, I got the, the partner of the house. Now, happiness achieved, like, go me. Um, it's more of this, this cycle of the hero's journey where you take on a new challenge. And I mean, this is why we love movies where people go through challenges. Imagine you watch a movie and someone's just like happy all the time, right? Oh, my life's great. And then like at the end of the movie, life's still great. It's this thing about you take on something new. You take on a new challenge yes. and the challenge is full of difficulty. Yes. And then you take it on and you figure it out and you go into the, what's called the inmost cave in the journey where you're right up against your greatest existential angst, like the, the hardest thing in the world, your greatest fears, the hardest thing. Uh, and then you kind of find this otherworldly strength and then you break through, right? Uh, and if you're taking on something hard, like a startup or a book or whatever, you're going through that all the time. You're yeah. up against yeah, it, yeah, you know? Yeah, you're yeah. like, I can't do it, this is so hard. And then you're just like, ah, we'll do it, you know? Yeah, yeah. And the thing is that, and then you sort of come out the other side and then you reap the reward. So happiness is, happiness is more like, I see like a fruit that you pick up along the journey. You're like, you go through the hard bit and then you're like, oh, strawberries. Hey, <laughs> happy times. And then it starts again, the cycle. And then you're in it and then you're in the kind of cauldron at the coal face of that hard thing of um, pushing yourself. Yes, yes. And then all the nice things happen, More adversity right? and then a mango. More adversity that's and then totally, some blueberries. Totally, totally. So I think when you see life, and that's what, it, but that's what it's meant, that's what life is meant to be. Yes. Like we are built for this. We yes. are built to go into the challenge. Yes. And then reap the rewards of the challenge. Yes. So now that I see the world like this, that it's all this thing that you go into and then you sort of have a nice time and then you go into it and you come out of a nice time, you have a very different expectation of life than that, oh, you're just gonna like reach this plateau where everything's gonna be cool, because that just doesn't happen. Maybe it happens for some you know, people. I don't think it happens. This is actually a perfect way to describe um, how we both also, I'm pretty sure you also think similarly about leveling up a character in a mm -hmm. game. And so when we're, you know, the, the character doesn't reach level 10 or 20 or whatever, and then it's like, oh, 
all said and done. It's this constant process of you're at level one, you're getting through adversities, building up skills, getting some rewards, experience points, level up, you're at level two now. And then you do the same process and you keep going, leveling up till all the way until you're, um, you've, you've achieved all of these awesome, fulfilling, um, fulfilling drives that you've, that you've set forth in your life. And Okay, let's get into some of the technicals now. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do this. So we keep going on about this stuff forever. I know you. Yeah, you and I. Am no, I, I, I think it's very interesting. I, I love talking I about do it too. Yeah. yeah, and I love I love hearing you talk about it because you have really synthesized a lot of the core um, concepts together, and it's it's very powerful, Katie. But, but also, powerful. I mean, you can't get serious about changing the world unless you get serious about your own existential needs and your own creative drive like they're all interwoven the reason why you want to change the world why you want to have an impact on the world is because of your spiritual existential yearning to do that and yeah. you can't do it without the creative genius zone so understanding that you're not going to just like oh i'm going to start a hydroponics company and i'm just going to like share vegetables with everybody and then you're going to just experience this wonderful perfect life I mean, I can't write a book about saving the world unless I get really real with that process that you have to go into this difficulty of pushing yourself and then come out again and go into it with that expectation. Yeah. Uh, so I felt it was very important to, to get that real, that human personal journey side in, in the book because the, the way I wrap up the book at the end is saying that Everybody has lots of ideas, right? But you need to be able to take the leap. You need to actually pick up the phone call, the call and call up the government for the idea you have. You have to pitch for funding. You have to be every day in the game, right? And that's where people hold back. People want to do the thing, but they don't make the phone call. They don't pitch. They don't spend the weekend on YouTube figuring out how to solve the electronics, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, unless you get really real with your own personal energy with how you're going about whatever project you're working on you're not going to be able to to do it for the years and actually make the social impact that you want to have you really have to have the fire inside you to do it otherwise you're just another person who's got ideas that's just like oh i'd really like to make the world a better place you know that'd be so cool like the execution is so crucial in the yeah. 3d reality that we live in let's let's get into some of the technicals so i want you to teach us about this idea of you know, setting a goal and a basic unit of measure. And then there's this process of a value action gap with behavior design. And we have one of the, you know, we have your, your really cool rainbow, rainbow caterpillar. caterpillar. Yeah. Uh, I love this. The how to save the world rainbow caterpillar in summary. This is towards the end of the book where you actually um, lay out the, the 10 um, critical uh, components that you actually go through throughout the book. And so, We'll go through some of these things as, as we talk, but go ahead and explain to us on that first part of, you know, setting a goal and this basic unit of measure is, is just such a, you know, a very simple thing, but we don't sometimes, you know, think about the importance of that. Yeah, so the value action gap is this phenomenon which very few people know about, but everybody who wants to make an impact on the world really must know about it. And it's very easy to test, and it's just this. If you have a class of 20 people, and you show them a documentary about climate change and energy, they will become, one, educated about the topic, and two, they will care. You can test them. Mm -hmm. Test them beforehand, test them afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, you test them six months later as to whether they did anything, they create an action, nothing. You can ask people, do you care about the environment? 85, 90 cent of people will say, uh, sorry, percent will say, sure. Then would you spend more money on products? Sure. When they're at the shop? No. Right? So the word value action gap means that people have the values, right? You can educate people and you can make them genuinely care. But that doesn't lead to a behavior because trying to get people to do a behavior in the physical world is kind of a different science to getting people to be educated and care. You can give people... So it's whether you're taking... And it's also called the information deficit hypothesis, which means basically... If you think that you can get people to change by giving them information, glaciers are falling apart, animals are getting extinct, trees are being cut down. This is all the, what the state of water quality is in lakes, right? Giving people information, which is documentaries, books, blogs, podcasts, um, even games, educational games fall into this. Anything that's educational or content-based, right? 
It'll work to educate people, but it won't work to get people to change, or it might a tiny bit. The behavioural lens is a totally different path to go down if you actually want to get people to act, and you don't even need to educate people that much. You can just do a 5% of the education you were planning, planning on doing. So the way this goes into measurement is the first thing you need to do is to just have a look at the data, have a look at the numbers. Now this might sound incredibly obvious. Oh yeah, look at the numbers of what you want to change. But I've been speaking to social and environmental entrepreneurs, impact people my whole life. And I would say at least five, maybe even eight out of 10 people when you ask them about the numbers, they don't know or they haven't even looked at it. People work on climate change without knowing the carbon intensity or the kilowatt hours in their own city. Like they just haven't looked it up, right? Yeah, yeah. They'll be working on all different sorts of projects. People work on food waste without actually looking at the data on food waste. People working on promoting veganism and vegetarianism without looking at the numbers of how much meat is actually produced. Where are the abattoirs? How does it work? Where does it get sold? You know, actually looking at like a data stream of meat and animal products uh, rather than a vegan community that we want to make bigger, right? So number one is just looking at the numbers. That's the first step. Just look at the numbers. And you'll find that there's this actually really interesting body of, um, of research and it's called disclosure or transparency, which is where the government mandates that the numbers have to be transparent. So that's what we have with nutritional labeling. You ha if you sell food, you have to put nutritional labels on it. And the government makes you do that and it has a design parameter. <laughs> so if the government makes the data uh, makes all the companies make the data public, it's the same with car safety ratings, right, as well, then uh, the numbers are all public. And then once the numbers are public, then you've really got something to work with to try and drive change. So it's just this one, like, basic thing. And there's this quote in the book from Bill Gates who says that, uh, you know, the first thing you need to do to make change, I can't remember it exactly, is, is to measure everything and figure out a measure to drive change in a feedback loop. And he says it sounds really simple, but it's surprising how hard it is to do and how easy it is to get wrong or how easy it is to be forgotten. Yes, yes. So I think m maybe half to three quarters of people working in this space just don't do the measurement side very well or haven't made it the core of their model. And that's the first thing. Just make sure what you're doing is making an impact. Make sure you're looking at the numbers. And so all the other nine steps in the book build from that one basic measurement and the idea of making that a feedback loop, like a Fitbit. So when you make something, you basically, oh, look, what we did worked. We could measure it. We reduced plastic by 10%. Again, it sounds so simple that you'd be surprised how often it is not done. Yeah, and this is one of those, one of those concepts of such importance because we, you know, you give this great example, you're in the classroom and you're giving people a um, um, powerful education on a subject and they're like, yay, we tested that we understood and we incorporated this into our lives. And people say that they would you know, go and make an actionable change, but then when they're actually there months later, they're potentially not making an actionable change. So how do we get people to make an actionable change? Well, data is a major part of this. Um, the displays, these visuals that you're explaining to giving, giving us um, totally change beha behavior when you're seeing the parts per million here or where you're seeing beautiful augmented reality displays of the trees on top of buildings where you go as you walk down Market Street in San Francisco or through Central Park in New York, wherever you're at, that it totally makes sense that these are the ways to incrementally get people to, to desire to actually make change with their behavior as well. And now I want you to give us a kind of like one of your main um, principles of design with changing behavior? Uh, well, there's, there's three that go together that I think are the most simplest framework for what excites, that's in the book, but also is personally most interesting to me, which is one, you measure everything and make a feedback loop. So a good example of that is getting people to slow down driving, right? Say you have like billboards or maybe TV commercials about in Australia, we used to have these hor horrifically frightening television commercials telling people to stop speeding. It was screaming, blood, you know, oh very goodness. scary. Uh, but then that's not, someone's, when they're watching that, they're not in the car, right? Yeah. They're kind of watching television and they may be in the car like 24 hours later, right? Versus, so that's an educational approach, right? So the data-driven approach would be, 
those um, signs that show you how fast you're going. And they say, maybe flash saying um, you know, how many miles you're going. So if you're coming up to a school zone, you know, they'll say this is the speed limit and this is how many miles you're going. Instant change. Data feedback loop got you straight away. That's an example of changing behavior. So the, the educational approach just doesn't quite filter down into the behavior. But numbers, and so there are a number of examples in the book of uh, showing people whether it's how much energy you're using, uh, paper recycled at universities, cans recycled. You just show people a number. And you can even do it by hand. You don't need to be electronic. You can just write it with a pen. Obviously, you need somebody updating it. A sign that shows how many cans have been recycled. The number of cans recycled went up by like 60-something percent. I mean, these are big changes, like 60, I think it's 67 or 68 percent. Yeah. Similar with paper, I think it was 77 percent. Uh, energy, showing people how much energy they use. It can be between 5 or 7 percent. Even some case studies go up to 40 percent. Just showing people the numbers in a feedback loop, right? Anyway, so that's like the first principle. The second principle is social comparison. Like what we were talking before, how when, like if you were like, if we got a little report card that said, oh, you use, you know, or you create five pounds of trash and I create seven pounds, I'll just be like, oh, why am I, like, why am I do doing more? This is, I gotta get it down. I gotta beat him. I gotta at least not be worse. So this social comparison based on data, again, it sort of segues from data, uh, is quite possibly one of the most powerful ways to get into the human psyche. So we could both watch a documentary on garbage and be like, ooh, that's bad, right? But if we're given the data and then we're ranked and compared, and maybe there's all of us in a classroom or in a community or at a university or in an office, and we're all ranked in a leaderboard from top to bottom, yeah. then we're all like, I want to do better on the leaderboard, you know? Not because we're all desperately competitive, but we all just sort of want to do better, right? It's just this disclosure of data. Yeah. So that social comparison is the second one. And the third one is color, right? People that are doing um, not as well can get red or, or corporations or blocks, city blocks or governments, any, anything, a product. And you've got the whole rainbow to work with. Green is good, all the way down. Uh, and these basically three... You gave us example with your car color stickers. Oh yeah, car color. That, that's a low-tech thing, right? Yeah. We already have um, miles per gallon disclosure labeling for cars, but they don't include color. And what's so interesting about color is uh, it is immediately recognizable by the human mind. Like that's why traffic lights are colors, right? Can you imagine if the traffic light said the words go um, and stop? Like it actually said stop and go in words without the color? Like how much harder it would be to figure out what was going, it'll just take you a little while, right? Yeah. Whereas the color is, it's just so so immediate and it's also it is, yeah. emotional. If you get red, you're like, if you see a red light flashing, you're instantly like, oh, that's bad, right? Or a green light flashing, you're like, okay, we're cool. So color's enormously motivating and yeah. it's signaling, it signals data. So you can put those three things together, and those basically three principles in my design page on my website is the basic framework for all of my concept designs. And it's something anybody can bring in to their project. And you can apply it to just about, just about anything. And then you can just add more bells and whistles on the top, right? But I mean, that's just like some just super powerful mechanisms. And you'll come across organizations that don't have that, right? Say, for example, environmental certifications that are just like one or they have it or they don't have it. You know, even like B Corp, for example, they don't have that disclosure of data, the feedback loop, the comparisons, the leaderboard based on data, and then applying color and range. These basic principles. And so you really wonder, like, what's the link of causality? Maybe it is making a big change, but I don't know if the causality is really very substantial these are so so good i mean, i love color i love the the data being more transparent and more and more visible of at, moving forward to actionable change um i love this the step of measuring it the goal visualizing the new world you having your idea storm idea evaluation behavioral change systems thinking game design telling the story tribes and tipping points technology this is kind of your curve and i want us to oh, that's get the rainbow caterpillar the rainbow yeah. caterpillar <laughs> 
And I want us to... Gotta put it back on. It's okay, not on the screen. It, okay, let's put it back I on. I can't remember the whole okay, rainbow caterpillar, it, even though on. I made it. <laughs> Measure it, the goal, visualize your okay. world, idea storm, idea evaluation, behavior change, system thinking, game design, tell your story, tribes and tipping points, and technology. And so we kind of spent a good amount of time already getting up through behavior change. So now let's talk about um, this latter half, the blue to purple. So teach us about getting us all the way up to tribes, tipping points, and technology um, in terms of saving the world. Okay, okay. The book is very, I actually have a two hour workshop on this. It takes me two hours to go through all the case studies it, it as quickly as possible. So it's, a, it's um, ambitious to try and get it all in um, to the interview. So basically, yeah, so step two, sorry, I've just got to slightly start at the beginning a bit further back, but um, you have a goal. So you know where you're at, you know where you are now, and then you say where you want to go, right? Goal, a measurable goal, might sound really obvious. Again, it's missing from so many organizations, but once you've got a goal, a goal number, you can visualize it. If your goal is to cover cities with 80% vegetation, then you can visualize, you see? So having your numerical goal, like a progress bar, this is where you are now, this is your progress by where you want to go. That's a design feature and then track it along the way and then visualize like we were talking about, visualize this world and make that your big dream that you are uh, selling. And then from there you can extract ideas once you've got this visualization. And so one of the exercises is write a hundred ideas down. Just keep digging and digging and digging into the ideas. And then when you've got your ideas, then you can figure out how to assess them and then layer these things like social norms, pledges, just asking somebody to write down Instead of making an elaborate documentary about some issue, just go up to people and say, would you like to write down something that you would like to commit to? Like, what's something you would like to do better in terms of an environment? Just name something. Transition to biodegradables. Yeah, so if I got you to write down with a, with a pen, like you got a pen right there. Yes. If you yes. just write a little note, Yes. And you write, I pledge to Katie to transition to, you don't have to put my name down. I pledge okay. to transition to biodegradables. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That one behavior, totally low tech, no budget, is one of the most powerful things you can do to get people to change. And you can add that pledge onto anything you're trying to get people to do. Because mm -hmm. it's free, right? It's easy. I pledge. You have an art project. Have the people look at the art project and then pledge. You've got someone standing there with like a, you know, so easy, but it will work. That will work. Whereas just getting them to learn about it won't um, work. So that's an example of in behavior. Um, systems thinking is just like, you know, something, for example, like defaults. Like one example is with organ, um, like America has a lower rate of organ donation on the driver's license than other countries because other countries have it a default. You have to opt out versus opt in. So it's just a form design thing. Like it's either crossed out and you have to tick it or if you just do nothing, you're instantly in. So for example, um, with air uh, aircraft, meals, what if all the meals were default vegan and then you have to opt in to get meat? Mm. Most people would just go with the vegan. And so you could take all of that environmentally heavy meat dishes out of the uh, out of the aircraft. And you wouldn't be telling, it's like, you can still have meat, we're not forcing vegetarianism on anybody. But it's just looking for those default cases where we do things just because it's the default. Mm -hmm. Is the only, are you putting plastic water out for everybody where everyone just grabs it just because it's the default? Yep. You know, all these little things looking through. Um, and now the game design is looking at ways that you can, what you can do with your uh, data. So we've already talked about comparison, progress bars, like there's an example of like emotive animals that if you just put the positive feedback, so you say, good job, right? And then the animal is smiling, that these, the students that were tested on how much they, how well they did on the test, did 23% better than using an owl that was no expression. So owl with no expression, you put a smiley face on the owl, their scores go up by 23%. Interesting. Okay, these are just like little things that you can do. They're kind of like front-end design, uh, design techniques. Again, using color, kind of all the stuff that we've been talking about. And telling your story is then turning that into a, a journey. So that's the hero's journey, the 12 steps in the hero's journey. So you don't do things like say, the world is really terrible. <laughs> or you don't do things where you say, 
Well, when I was six years old, I really cared about the dolphins, and that's why you should care about the dolphins, because I care. You don't want to make it all about yourself. Uh, you don't want to make it all doom and gloom. Or you don't want to make it all technical, just like here's the data, blah, blah, blah. You take people on a journey. So that starts with saying, it's these 12 steps. It starts with having um, empathy. That's what's called the, uh, the ordinary world. So it'll be like, this is what the world is like now. And then you have the call to adventure, but the world could be fantastic. It could be like this. And then the third step is uh, refusal of the call, where you, and you were like, you're probably thinking that I'm crazy, but I'm not. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then you introduce yourself. And the reason why you can trust me is because I have these qualifications, or my organization. And then the next step, that's step four, meet the mentor. And then step five is cross the threshold. And then you say, will you come with me? You invite them, come with me on a journey and let me explain why. Mm-hmm. And then you go through the steps and then you go into the inmost cave in the ordeal. And then we say, okay, this is why it's going to be really great and interesting. But this is why it's going to be really hard. You're going to have to give up this. That's going to be tough. And then you go really deep and you go, this is why it matters. The most existentially substantial reason for why it matters. Not just because like trees matter so you couldn't cut them down. It forces you to dig deeper. So you'll say something like, you know, your soul is connected to the planet. You can't feel good about yeah. who you are when you know bad things are happening. You have to, to be real with who you are, do something that is connected to trees. None of us can live with ourselves when we know that bad things are going on in the world. So you come up with something that's really like strong that gets people like, yeah, okay, okay, you got me, you got me. Um, and then they come out of that, and then you have like the happy ending, you know? And then you basically, okay, we win the war, we defeat the enemy, maybe the enemy's deforestation, and this is the beautiful happy ending. This is, this is the world, this is what we're all going for. And the Hero's Journey 12 Steps will take you through that. So I've got a, just a nice little snapshot, nice little exercises of how you can get, use the Hero's Journey for an, tell a non-fiction story. Even the most boring of non-fiction stories can be made interesting with the Hero's Journey. Mm-hmm. Nine tribes and tipping points, that's about marketing and social influence. Basically that people copy each other. Mm-hmm. It's that simple. Totally. Again, don't worry about educating people, just get people to copy each other. Mm-hmm. It's called social diffusion. That's how everything happens mm-hmm. in the world. Uh, and just being real with what you, what you want to make. I mean, when I mean being real, I just mean, I would like people to just make things that they personally think are really awesome because then other people will think they're awesome too. I think people ask too much advice from other people like oh do you like my t-shirt design do you like my t-shirt design do you think you should do this t-shirt design and then everybody's asking everybody else do you like my t-shirt and then everybody ends up the same this is so interesting so there's this example earlier in the book about this guy jesse schnell or shell um who's a wrote this game design textbook and he said that he was he said that's exactly what happens in juggling it's why it's such a good example right so in juggling everybody's looking how to juggle like all the other jugglers That's how you learn, you look at other jugglers. But there's this one juggler who does not, refuses to learn to juggle from other jugglers. He goes to the ballet, he goes to look at swans, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, He looks at machines, and so he gets whole new ideas. And apparently this guy is just totally different to all the other jugglers, he's got this amazing style. And this guy, Jesse, the young Jesse, was just uh, completely just wrapped with this one other juggler. And he says, don't, and his line is, don't look at what everyone else is doing, look somewhere else. Yep. yep. And so, I think that's, yeah, that's just so, so down. It's like, don't keep, stop asking people what they think all the time. Just do what you think is awesome. Yes. Just go where your inspiration is, right? It's and like then, the dancer that went out and started dancing when no one else was dancing and then got the first <laughs> follower to yeah, come yeah, and yeah. dance with them. And so this is a very important point too, is that when you're, when you're, the, you're right that when you have a new mental map update, the, the importance of the memes spreading to get more people to copy that update of the mental map is very important. But then also that creates a, 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 a culture um, of, of, of a, a homogenous culture that then we have to again divert out from that homogenous culture to look into other places to see how we can update the map to the next iteration. So it's this constant process of, of iterating and, and I, I, I like that a lot and looking, especially when people talk about like, oh, I don't, well, the one rule of the 
of the chief executive officer that I'm hiring for my new company is that they have previously never worked at a healthcare company. Okay. And, like, yeah. That's like that's the new rule. Is that oh, is you, it? Yeah. <laughs> it's like and you don't hire anyone for the CEO position that's had 20 years of running a healthcare company. It's hire someone from way outside of the industry that is thinking in novel ways mm. about how to innovate on the company. So I'm glad that that you brought that one up. And so yeah, I finish mean, us off. On oh, it. it's just. But it's real. Everything that is in this book, I got from outside of the environmental profession. Seriously, every single thing. Like there's, I got it from um, living in Silicon Valley in hacker houses, learning how to code. That's how I learned about sensors and satellite data and all that. I got it from studying behavioral psychology, you know, books like Nudge and all the other related behavioral psychology books. Um, uh, and I got it from studying about game design and learning about how games were built. And I got it from the self-help <laughs> and from the self-help industry. Like, and so I learned all this amazing stuff that was just, that now I bring to the environmental world. But I did not get it from within sustainability, you know, which is the environmental engineering, ecology, etc. So I think everybody has to jump outside of their silo yes. and learn. And then that's how innovation happens. That's how new things, new things happen. Uh, so, and also, I mean, who wants everybody to just be the same? Everyone looking at everyone to be the same. Take the knowledge from multiple disciplines and bring it in and then be able to innovate that way. And this is a very powerful book. And Katie, this is such a pleasure to be able to talk to you about it and to unpack it with you in this interview. I want to ask you a couple questions that we normally ask on the way out of our show. I'm glad we talked a little bit about cybernetic earth and like kind of the future of that technology. Um, I'm curious as to where you kind of see um, a lot of the a lot of the um, the artificial intelligence technologies, the blockchain technologies, the sensor technologies, the biotechnologies, neurotechnologies, where do you see this all um, leading to? I'm not an expert on all those things. <laughs> but where do you see that with the That's cybernetic... That's a lot of things. That's a lot yes, of things. Yes, within the cybernetic earth perspective, within the archaeological perspective, within the, um, the how to save the world ideology. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know that much about uh, the whole synthetic biology and neuroscience developments, so I, wouldn't, I haven't really thought about that yet. Um, but... The artificial intelligence nexus with the cybernetic earth is really interesting because ultimately it's being able to predict. It's taking data and doing predictions. So there are infinite examples of what you can do with that. Obviously climate change. Take the climate, the earth's climate data and then predict uh, what the climate's going to be. What about surface temperature? You know, with like a FLIR camera. Can you look at the surface temperature and then project for the next 24 or 48 hours, you know, for agriculture or for fire? Uh, what about air pollution? How do you predict? And when I studied environmental engineering, which was 20 years, I started 20 years ago now, uh, one of the main things we learned was the calculus of predicting pollution. You know, you've got a pollution cloud, and then you have to do all this complicated calculus to figure out, well, where will the pollution cloud be in five days and how far will it go, right? So predicting pollution, predicting impact, temperature, kilowatt hours. Uh, what about the relationship between how many trees you have in your city? Should a city spend another $100 million on tree projects, how will that affect the peak kilowatt hours that the city is using during peak demand because trees cool the city and how will that affect the carbon dioxide emissions? What's your future projection based on your previous data? So you can feed all the previous data into an AI model and then predict, well, basically, if we spend $100 million on trees, that means we don't need to spend $100 million on a new peak power plant for when it gets really hot, right? And if you can model that and you can make a case to basically be like, well, don't build the new gas power station, put the trees in instead so the city doesn't get so hot, so we don't need so much air conditioning, you could do that with AI. And that's what's really exciting. And it's only just started. People have only just started modeling this type of stuff using satellite doing image processing of satellite images and then using that data you can get a satellite image every day now I love and this. then looking into the future and looking at how different environmental metrics air pollution temperature kilowatt hours rainfall water flood how yeah. do they all affect each other 
yeah. through the mathematical models and how do we get better at predicting that. So that's something that's really exciting. Interesting. So it's actually taking a lot of the, of the heavy work of the calculations and it's making the, um, the, our creative endeavoring more easy because it's taking the workload of the hard calculations off of us, crunching so many of the mathematical mm -hmm. models with the different variables to figure out what is the best um, design of the systems that maximize uh, environmental sustainability. Interesting. Um, I want to ask you, okay, the three questions we ask on the way out of the show. The first question is, do you think we're alone in the cosmos? Oh, you mean like aliens? Oh, I, I don't know. I don't know, but I also don't think it matters. I mean, we seem to be alone for now based on the evidence, but I mean, so, so what? Like, we still have to make our own work earth work we still need to have friends and fall in love and eat food and uh, not get depressed and uh, have meaningful lives and eat and raise children I mean we've got all very important things I think to do do you think that we come from somewhere outside of the three-dimensional reality into these earth suits <laughs> oh I don't know um I a, a little bit, yeah. I, I actually have a double-page spread that's really lovely in my in my book about the the universe, the beginning of time of the universe. So oh, it was yeah, this I remember that one. energy blob. Yeah. Yeah. This big. You can actually get a photo of it on Wikipedia. The energy blob yeah. when the universe was nine years old. I think it was nine years old. <laughs> Maybe it was nine million. <laughs> uh, baby universe. Yeah, baby. And then out of the blob of energy, there weren't even atoms. There wasn't even gravity. Like there were, and then the the laws of the universe started to happen and then atoms formed and then atoms stuck together into bigger molecules and then into planets and then life. So if you look at that, like there's this creative energy. If you think, look at that energy blob, that energy blob wanted to create. Mm -hmm. It created atoms and it's trying to create and it made itself from a blob into what it is now. And we're kind of part of that. So if you want to say that that's like an earth suit with that energy kind of going through us, yeah, that's what I, I mean, I don't use the word earth suit. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that yeah. you, uh, we're a continuum of that creative process. Yeah. That's our kind yeah. of life's work. And that's, that's why we're here. We're here to continue the creative evolution of the universe. Yes, yes. And do you believe we're in a simulation? Uh, no, no, I don't. Sorry, am I meant to say yes? Because that's the no, day of the not, show. No, 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 not at all. No. Absolutely not. We, are, we welcome all different perspectives uh, on, on the show on that question. Absolutely. We always welcome all different perspectives, period, on the show. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. So, what are, what are your thoughts? Are we in a simulation? Uh, no, but I don't... I know that some people think that, but it's not really my scene. Okay. I'm more in the practical, like, let's just, like, get a tree planted by the end of the day kind of, <laughs> kind of scene. And the last question is, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? most beautiful thing in the world. Oh, right now my three-year-old girl is starting to look like a miniature movie star. I mean, she's just objectively very, very cute. Not even my mother's opinion, she just is. Fact, you can meet her, you'll agree. Aww. And I get to wake up with her every morning. She's just like this in my arms yeah, and I get yeah. to see this beautiful being. So it's, it's yes, really yes. wonderful. There's a lot of craziness that comes with molding a mind into the world. So we wish you the best of luck <laughs> with Anastasia. Three yes. years old, yeah. Almost four. Almost She'll four. be four in two weeks. It's yeah. coming, it's coming. The, the, it's cool that, it's cool how, what you were teaching me earlier about how the mind being uh, um, like origami, it's kind of like, you know, Anastasia's exploring her, you know, fullest potential now in the world and how, what's gonna be her little puzzle piece that she fits into the great eight billion human story. It's yeah, a very she, interesting thing. she is the piece of origami that is unfolding, and I just got to kind of like hang back, just do death prevention, basically make sure for she's okay. Nutrients, um, yeah. And then the yeah nutrients, death prevention, most important things, and uh, and then the origami just kind of unfolds on its own. It's really fascinating to watch. Yeah, yeah. This has been such a pleasure, Katie. Thank you so much for coming on to our show. Thanks for having me. We really yeah. appreciate it. <laughs> We really, really appreciate it. And we would love for everyone to check out the links below to Katie's work. Check out katiepatrick.com. Check out the new book, How to Save the World. Really help you a lot with your execution. 
and we hope to see all of your ideas come to fruition. So check us out, go follow Katie on Twitter as well, her link's below. And we would love for you to comment on your thoughts on the episode. So give us your thoughts in the comments below. Also go and share the content with other people about how to save the world. Some of these idea execution strategies, go and share, so share them with your family, your community, your friends online, on the internet, go and share them around. Support the artists and entrepreneurs that you believe in. Simulations links are below. Support us, help us grow, help us prosper as well. And support the artists in your communities, help them grow. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace.